Welcome to Power Problems, a podcast from the Cato Institute where we offer a skeptical take on U.S. foreign policy and discuss some of today's big questions in international security with guests from across the political spectrum. I'm Trevor Thrall, a senior fellow at Cato. And I'm Emma Ashford, a research fellow here at Cato. Today we're back on the topic of the Iran nuclear deal after Trump declined to certify Iranian compliance. Our guest is Colin Call, an associate professor of political science at Georgetown University and a former deputy assistant to the president and national security advisor to Vice President Joe Biden. Uh, let's start, as we always do, with some news review. Um, first, uh, you know, in a break from its traditional role, the CIA is set to uh, take on an expanded role in hunting and killing uh, terrorists in Afghanistan. Um, how's that looking for you guys? Well, uh, hi, Trevor. Thanks for having me on the program. Um, I mean, in general, I think that uh, the CIA's role as a paramilitary entity should be as limited as possible. Um, I think, you know, I don't know, have any inside information other than what I'm reading in the in the newspapers, but if it's right that uh, basically CIA counterterrorism units are partnering with contractors and a- Afghans to go after Taliban as opposed to al-Qaeda or Islamic State leadership, uh, that would be a substantial uh, expansion of the CIA's role inside Afghanistan and probably in a way that would tax their resources uh, considerably. Um, in fact, one source of the leak might be those within uh, the intelligence community who are concerned that this is an expansion of their mission in a way that would uh, distract from higher value targets. Um, I think if this is indicative of of a broader uh, trend towards us getting back into the counterinsurgency business in Afghanistan, uh, that's a pretty slippery slope towards a much more expanded mission. I understand that the Trump administration's strategy ultimately is to put pressure on Taliban leadership to try to encourage them back to the negotiating table, and I get that. Um, But I I worry about uh, making the CIA uh, the pointy end of the spear on that one. Yeah, it it sort of seems like this might be Mike Pompeo's hand directing things um, because he's said a number of times that he wants the agency to be more aggressive. And he's never quite specific about what that means. Does he mean more targeting, more operations? Does it mean this kind of more paramilitary uh, stuff and a shift away from perhaps traditional espionage? And I I think, again, from the point of view of, of the CIA itself, which had been perhaps shifting a little away from that counterterrorism mission and back towards its more traditional role of intelligence gathering with regard to other states, this would seem to sort of short circuit that shift. I also think that a terrorist is not a terrorist is not a terrorist. That is that while it, it makes very much sense to focus our intelligence resources on elements of al-Qaeda leadership in the Islamic State, potentially elements of the Haqqani network uh, that target American forces. That is groups that either directly threaten Americans or th- or threaten to commit attacks against the United States or citizens abroad. I get that. But if the articles uh, are right that the CIA is getting into the Taliban hunting business, uh, that's a dramatic expansion against actors that are a, a significant threat to governance and stability inside of Afghanistan, but not a direct threat on a, 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 to the United States. For me, looking at this from the broader historical sweep, if you look at the times when the CIA has gotten itself into trouble, hot water, um, it's been when it moved beyond the strictly intelligence role into paramilitary, into, you know, non-intelligence efforts of various kinds, all the way from, you know, just hunting bad guys to, I don't know, toppling governments and so on. And I just think it's safer for all of us if the CIA stays inside, uh, stays in its lanes, if you will. And I, and I do agree with you, Emma, that this looks to me like it has Pompeo's sort of signature on it because he's probably the most partisan person running the CIA in some time, um, maybe since somebody back in the Reagan administration possibly. But um, to, to me, that's a bad that's a bad combination of partisan person in, in that job. Uh, OK, let's uh, talk about Rex Tillerson. Tillerson's been traveling um, the Gulf as well as Afghanistan, Pakistan and India later uh, this week. Um, it's a whirlwind a trip for him. Yeah, I mean, uh, look, I think it's important for uh, for Tillerson to get out there, um, especially to parts of the world that aren't getting as much attention. Uh, I think, you know, the trip to India is important. Um, I've been a little troubled by some of the comments uh, in the last few days on Iraq specifically. You know, he got himself in some trouble uh, uh, with some comments alongside the Saudi foreign minister talking about how uh, Iranian-backed militia inside Iraq had to depart Iraq, uh, only to be reminded by the prime minister of Iraq uh, that 
these militia are actually Iraqis who are who live in Iraq, uh, and that the Hashtashabi, the popular mobilization forces, uh, many of them uh, cooperate alongside the inter- uh, the Iraqi security forces. Some of them are integrated into them. And while I think we should be very concerned about the role that some of the hardcore groups, especially groups like Kateb Hezbollah and Asab al-Haq, those that are kind of wholly owned subsidiaries of of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, uh, the IRGC uh, Quds Force uh, from Iran, these are Iraqis. Uh, and the, the best way to balance Iranian interests inside Iraq over the long term is to maintain a strategic partnership with Iraq. And the best way to compromise that is to do things and say things that put us at odds uh, with uh, a body's government in Iraq. Uh, so this was an own goal uh, by Tillerson. It's probably recoverable, but completely unnecessary, especially at a time when the campaign against the Islamic State inside of Iraq is essentially culminating. Uh, there's only one stronghold left. It's along the border in a place called Al-Qaim. Uh, and as that campaign culminates, the natural friction points between us and Iran are going to go up uh, inside uh, Iraq. So uh, this was, I think, something that he said perhaps gratuitously to impress his Saudi uh, counterpart, um, but it was not helpful to the politics inside Iraq. Per Rex, he's, he's always putting his foot in his mouth, I feel. And I don't know if that's just because he hasn't bothered staffing up the State Department, doesn't have good advice, or he's just not very good at this in general. But I will say one one thing in his favor about this trip. Um, he has gone to Saudi Arabia and he went to Qatar and he has addressed the Gulf crisis. And the line that he has actually taken on the Gulf crisis between those countries has been pretty reasonable. He's actually saying, well, look at this, look at the situation. It looks like the uh, so-called anti anti-terror quartet, that's Saudi Arabia and its allies in this, um, are making very unreasonable demands. The Qataris seem to be willing to come to the table. And he's saying, well, it's it's up to the anti-terror quartet now to come to the table and negotiate with them. And this actually struck me as so unusual because it's something that you almost might see in a regular administration rather than this administration. But with Rex, who knows if he has the capacity or ability to, to try and solve the product crisis that way? Yeah, I mean, I, I, at the end of the day, I think there are, there are inherent limitations. First, he's not great at the job. Uh, and it doesn't appear like he's he's getting terribly better at it over time. Second, it's not clear he has top cover from the president of the United States who regularly kneecaps him uh, on issue after issue, North Korea being uh, a prominent one. And then the third is, Emma, is a point you made, which is there's no bench. Uh, there, you know, we're running this giant experiment um, of not having a government. Uh, we have a cabinet although not even all of those positions are filled uh, right now. Uh, and we have career civil servants who are denigrated as the deep state. And the entire middle of the government is pretty much absent. So even if, uh, you know, in the way that Tillerson is trying to compensate for that is to recreate a mini State Department on the seventh floor of the State Department uh, in and around policy planning. Um, but that's not how you run. Uh, that's not how you run a government. So he's not a particularly effective Secretary of State. And, he, and he's not put in a good place uh, by how uh, his uh, bureaucracy is being run or by his president to succeed. Yeah, absolutely. It, to me, it, I'm not sure why if I'm one of these countries he's visiting, um, I take Rex Tillerson seriously because, you know, he doesn't sound very well informed and you know he and Trump aren't talking every day. It, I, you, you can't really believe him. And if that's true for and if that's true for Tillerson, imagine what it is when we send an acting assistant secretary or an acting deputy assistant secretary or a charge d'affaires who is acting as the ambassador there who aren't political appointees, have no wasta with the West Wing, have no relationship to the president. So even if Tillerson can't be trusted to represent what the president actually believes, why would anybody believe any other representative of the, of the United States? Well, that's depressing. All right. Next topic. Uh, Japan. They're a good country, right? Um, so uh, Shinzo Abe's coalition government wins, you know, handily in, in, in the recent elections. Um, and, and and Abe has been calling for uh, not only tough responses to North Korean provocations, um, which I think he has very solid public support for, for his stance there, uh, but he has also been calling for revision to the Japanese constitution to loosen restrictions on Japan's self-defense forces, including being able to use them uh, for various military actions outside the country. That's been obviously hugely controversial in Japan over decades, um, but the timing seems like it could be right. Um, how's that going to work out? Well, I think one thing that should be said is I think that Abe has probably done better than any foreign leader in establishing a good working relationship with uh, with Trump. Uh, And he invested a lot in it early. Obviously, there was the meeting um, in New York uh, during the transition, followed up by uh, uh, the meeting down in Mar-a-Lago. 
Um, and uh, I think he gets Trump uh, in certain ways. And, and that relationship, I think, is, is solid. And, and Abe should be commended for how smartly I think he's played uh, that card. I think what you're basically seeing – uh, in Japan, and you know, I'm not I'm not the world's greatest expert probably on on this issue, but at least from my vantage point, you're seeing two things intersect. One is a legitimate threat uh, that the Japanese perceive from uh, from North Korea, uh, although. The, the nature of North Korea's capabilities that have advanced um, are really more of a threat to the United States in the sense that they already had medium range and intermediate range ballistic missiles that could they could uh, range Japan prior to the uh, last six months. The th thing that's really changed is their ability potentially to range uh, the United States with city busting weapons. But nevertheless, the threat seems a lot higher. The other thing, though, is that I think Abe is is capitalizing on that threat uh, to try to uh, sh push the narrative and the conversation inside uh, Japan in a direction that he's long wanted, which is to uh, revise and update uh, the Japanese constitution to allow Japan to play a more assertive military role in the region and around the world. I mean, Japan already spends you know, they're among the top spenders uh, on the military in the world. They have, uh, the, the, you know, uh, one of the world's top and most uh, sophisticated uh, militaries. Uh, they have more um, advanced aircraft uh, uh, in Japan than, than we have guarding the continental United States. I mean, they, they are a powerful uh, military uh, country, but they have certain inherent limitations um, as a consequence of their post-World War II uh, constitution that, that Abe would like to revise. I think the danger – and what he's pursuing is that in hugging Trump so closely and talking about uh, uh, reorienting uh, Japan's military role in the region, it could actually create some uh, tensions within the trilateral relationship between the United States, the Republic of Korea, that is South Korea and Japan, uh, because the Japanese and the South Koreans have a, have a very complicated history and uh, Japanese militarism is seen quite negatively inside of South Korea. I also think that South, the South Koreans, who are much more nervous about Trump's saber rattling than Abe is, uh, get nervous about Abe hugging Trump on, uh, on the North Korea issue. And then the other wild card is how the Chinese will react in the event that uh, the, that uh, Japan goes down the road of being more assertive militarily. So I get why Abe's do Abe is doing what he's doing, and I actually think it makes sense for Japan to play a more assertive uh, role as a global stakeholder and, uh, and a responsible actor. Uh, but there's some risk here too. Yeah, yeah. excellent points, boy. That, that's about it for that. I, I agree with everything you said there. All right, surprise question of the day. Um, so, Colin, uh, we ask this of everyone, uh, not just singling you out. Uh, what do you think is the most overhyped threat that people are talking about today facing the United States? I actually think the most overhyped threat uh, that the president talks about on a fairly regular basis is the threat posed by immigrants and refugees. Uh, I think you've actually just seen uh, in the last couple of days uh, that we're about to turn the spigot back on on refugees, although the total caps, I suspect, will be lower than they were under the Obama administration with some cosmetic changes in vetting. Um, my, my guess is they're, they're not all that significant. Uh, and I think that's in a recognition that, that uh, refugees don't pose a meaningful threat uh, to uh, the United States. Um, the same is true of immigrants. I think that you've, you've seen a president who has demonized these individuals because they're easy scapegoats for threats that don't actually exist. There, there, there have been no deadly terrorist incidents uh, um, perpetrated by uh, immigrants or refugees from the countries that the, that the president has, has targeted. Uh, and in fact, alienating us from those communities is probably more likely to generate uh, uh, risks of, of homegrown extremism, people uh, you know, taking action against the United States that are already here um, and or not being able to work with communities who could otherwise provide law enforcement with uh, tips uh, uh, on plots like that. So I think it's – I don't think it's, it's overhyped generically. Uh, but I think for the president and much of his base, uh, the immigrant and refugee issue is, is overhyped in a way that has real negative consequences uh, for actual human beings. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Our, our colleagues Alex Narosta and David Beer have written a lot about the lack of a threat from immigrants and refugees. So uh, I'll, I'll I'll vote with you on that one. All right, let's let's flip it around. What is uh, a really serious threat that's not getting nearly enough uh, play? You know, this is this is going to be a little bit of a cop out because it's not like you know the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or the Washington Post doesn't have the periodic articles uh, about this. But I actually think that um, the landscape of our competition uh, with 
uh, with Iran in the Middle East is changing outside of, we're talking about outside the four corners of the nuclear deal, in particular in the border areas between Iraq and Syria. So much has been focused in the last couple of years for understandable reasons on destroying the caliphate, that is destroying the Islamic State's uh, territorial base from which they can uh, threaten the, t the integrity of, of Iraq, Syria, and launch attacks against the United States and the West. That campaign is essentially culminated. Uh, Mosul uh, fell a few months ago. Raqqa fell uh, just in the past uh, week or so. Um, uh, they're really the only remaining uh, strongholds for the Islamic State are near the Iraq-Syria border. So on the Iraq side, I mentioned earlier uh, 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 al Qaim, uh, which is a traditional uh, Sunni insurgent stronghold on the Iraqi side of the, Syri of the border on the, on, in the mid-Euphrates River Valley. Uh, and then on the Syrian side, a stretch of towns um, uh, going up from Abu Kamal on, on just on the other side of al Qaim up to uh, Deir Azur. And I say all of this because right as we speak, uh, the same forces that we use to uh, defeat the Islamic State in uh, in Raqqa, the Syrian Democratic Forces, which is a coalition of northern Syrian Kurds and Arab tribes, is engaged in uh, a fight to retake uh, as, uh, areas around Deir Azur. But the Assad regime, the Iranians, Hezbollah, and Russia are also uh, focused on those same areas and the friction points, uh, the contact points between us and those forces are growing and growing at a time when geopolitical tensions remain strained with Russia and increasingly bad with Iran. So it's outside of the Iran nuclear deal, which I know we're going to talk about later, but I think is actually a hotbed or a, a potential flashpoint for conflict in which our forces uh, could be uh, targeted or killed by uh, by the axis of Assad uh, and vice versa in a way that could uh, spiral into, into conflict. You know, it's interesting that you bring that up now because that was something people, I think, seemed to be really concerned about like a year ago, year and a half ago after the Russians came in and there was talk about whether we could end up with some kind of Russian-U.S. conflict over Syria. And then it just seems to have died down that people have stopped worrying about it. Yeah. But you're, you're absolutely right that we are sort of approaching the point where those groups are, if not already in contact with one another, going to be very soon. Well, and Emma, the, a really important point that I know you know but the, for, for, our, for our listeners is that be, you know, prior to this, we were largely fighting over parts of Syria that, that the Axis of Assad didn't care very much about. Uh, that is areas in the north and the east that were, uh, you know, not not regime strongholds, didn't have a lot of economic resources, relatively sparsely populated. The difference with Deir Azor is that the regime has had an outpost there uh, for the entire war surrounded by the Islamic State, and there's a lot of oil and natural gas. And it's also in proximity to the Iraqi border. So strategically, it matters for Assad to control it because of the economic, uh, net for the, because of the natural resources. And it matters for uh, the Iranians uh, to uh, control it because they want access to the Iraqi border so that they can construct a logistical core or uh, that goes all the way from Iran through Iraq into Syria and then on uh, uh, on to Lebanon. So I think we've entered the phase in the campaign where the last remaining terrain actually matters uh, uh, very much to both sides, and that's new. Yeah. All right. Well, a good pivot uh, with that one to our main topic of the day, which is the Iran nuclear deal again. Um, so let's just start with with what I'm still a little bit puzzled by, which is what exactly does Trump think he's doing or getting by not certifying Iranian compliance? What's, what's the strategy here? Well, first of all, I'm not convinced that the entire decision was rooted in a strategy. Uh, the reporting suggests that it was rooted basically in a temper tantrum uh, by the president of the United States who hated the congressional requirement of every 90 days having to validate Obama's Iran deal. He just hated having to do it. He did it twice, and the and the second time he did it, he told his advisors, "I'm not doing this again," for no reason um, uh, that it was it wasn't rooted in anything other than uh, his belief that the deal was a bad deal, his political statements that it was a bad deal, and and that his north star, his his uh, for his foreign policy appears to be just to be the anti-Obama, to tear down the Trans-Pacific Partnership, to move away from the Paris Agreement, uh, and now the Iran deal uh, was next. And so I think the decertification play was actually concocted by his advisors as a way to satisfy and address Trump's anger uh, about the issue um, while not necessarily bringing the whole deal down. Now, as they've tried to rationalize the decertification and as some folks around town at various think tanks who have promoted decertification have tried to rationalize it, they have at least post 
Hawk created a strategic argument. And the strategic argument is that decertifying the Iran deal and handing the issue to Congress puts Iran and the international community on notice that the Iran deal is precarious and that the Americans might uh, snap back all of the sanctions on Iran and also have effects on foreign companies in Europe and elsewhere as a way of generating leverage, pressure to force the Iranians and the international parties that we negotiated the Iran deal with back to the table to renegotiate or expand the deal to address issues that either weren't covered by the deal or weren't covered to the satisfaction of critics. So that's the strategy. Whether it'll actually work, I'm, I'm, I'm doubtful, and we can, we can talk about that if you're interested. I think the next thing, though, to watch is exactly how Congress responds to this because they basically have two choices at the moment. They have 60 days under this congressional legislation called INARA, the Iran Nuclear Agreement Review Act that was passed in the summer of 2015. If the president decertifies, which Trump did last week, they have 60 days to debate on expedited procedures, whether to reimpose all of the nuclear-related sanctions that were suspended under the agreement. Given that Iran remains in technical compliance with the agreement, that's what the IAEA has said, that's what Trump's own senior officials have said, uh, and that most Republicans grudgingly uh, accept on Capitol Hill, I think it's highly unlikely that you'll see the Congress snap the sanctions back because I think they understand that that, in essence, would put us in material breach of the agreement, not the Iranians. So if they don't do that, then the, then the question will be, do they feel pressure to do something to strengthen the deal? And I think uh, you know Senator Corker, who has, let, let's just say, a complicated relationship with Trump, is nevertheless working with Senator Cotton on draft legislation uh, that I think they hope will be bipartisan that is aimed at trying to in their, at least in their terms, strengthen elements of the deal. But I think that a lot of uh, deal proponents worry would, re, would would be seen by Iran and the rest of the world as essentially unilaterally renegotiating it. So that's the period what, that we're at right now, um, and we'll and we'll have to see what Congress does. Yeah, one of the more interesting things I think here is that um, you're right. I, I think that Trump didn't have any kind of strategy when he set out to do this. But what it's effectively being treated as is kind of the ability to just reopen the nuclear deal. And it's being presented as a, well, now we can renegotiate, relitigate parts of it that we weren't 100 percent happy with the first time around. And so you do see people like Bob Corker who voted against it first time around saying, well, maybe we could set up some congressional legislation that would make this a better deal that would insert, you know, sunsets into the deal that would say if Iran made certain steps, which they're probably going to reach naturally in eight to 10 years, then the sanctions will snap back on. Um, and so this is kind of a, it's an interesting attempt to take an internationally negotiated treaty that was negotiated between six different parties, m more than six actually, but the P5 plus one as, as the main parties, and to then reopen it through a political process inside Congress. So we're basically asking Congress or Trump is asking Congress to rewrite an international agreement and then somehow hope that the other parties are going to go along with it. Yeah. So two, two things for me on that. One is, you know, asking Congress to step up and, and take the lead on foreign policy is a joke given their history. Um, that's just not what Congress tends to do. They meddle. They make things difficult, which I guess is their job. Uh, but leadership is not usually their forte. Um, and um, uh, sorry, now I've forgotten the other piece. Um, but uh, – oh, and the second piece is that uh, this really smacks of instead of America first, America alone. Uh, both Trump and the Republicans in Congress seem to uh, feel or believe that it's only what the United States does that matters. That As if we could renegotiate international agreements by ourselves at our own pleasure. And so, you know, one of the sort of next questions for me that I'd like to get your guys' take on is what, how are the Iranians – responding to this and, and the Europeans as well because they, they've got opinions about this. Yeah, I mean, well, the, the, the Iranians in some ways uh, are enjoying this actually because, I mean, it's a really hard trick uh, to construct a situation in which the Iranians who are quite aggressive uh, in, in violating international norms can play the victim. Uh, and yet the Trump administration has figured out the one way uh, to make sure that Washington is more isolated than Tehran and to generate as much global sympathy for the Iranians as possible by making it look like we're implementing the deal in bad faith. And this is, I think, part of the danger. I mean, obviously, 
that perception is locked in from the, the way the president has talked about this issue. You know, his speech uh, last week was extraordinarily uh, problematic. It was riddled with factual inaccuracies. It had haunting. Uh, it, it, it was haunted by certain ghosts of, of how the Iraq war was justified uh, in 2002, 2003 in terms of hyping connections with al-Qaeda and talking about WMD issues that weren't there and uh, invoking regime changes in all sorts of troubling uh, ways. But I think Congress runs the risk of also now adding to America's isolation, that America first means America alone. And the, the, here's how – here's how, what I think the risk is and this goes to, to Emma's point. Corker and Cotton are drafting legislation that in their view would address things that are inadequacies about the deal, either because uh, the deal didn't deal with certain uh, issues that they find troubling like Iran's ballistic missile program or that there are certain aspects of the deal like constraints on uh, civilian enrichment uh, – uh, Iran's civilian enrichment program, which could have dual use applications for uh, produ producing the explosive fuel for a nuclear weapon, that some of those constraints start to weaken at year 10 of the deal, that is year in 2025 or year 15 at the deal. And so they worry that under the deal, Iran could, could construct an industrial scale enrichment capability that would allow them potentially to uh, make the fuel for nuclear weapons. Now, your listeners should know Iran is never allowed to have nuclear weapons under their obligations under the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty and under this agreement and the intrusive verification procedures under the agreement never sunset and are forever and the additional protocol which allows the IAEA not only to go to declared facilities but undeclared ones is a pretty big deal. In fact, no country in the history of the world has built a nuclear weapon while under the additional protocol. So, there, the, But nevertheless, people are dissatisfied with some of the sunset provisions. So what the legislation would do, at least the drafts that, that I've uh, been told about, would establish a set of triggers that said if Iran crossed a number of technological thresholds and or if they didn't take certain steps on the ballistic missile front, that that would automatically trigger the reimposition of nuclear-related sanctions. The problem is, is that that writes into law uh, U.S. reapplying sanctions in the nuclear realm, even if Iran is with 100 percent technically compliant with the existing deal, which will be viewed correctly by not only the Iranians but the rest of the international community as us re unilaterally renegotiating the terms of this agreement, and that's a that's a big problem. Uh, and I, I will just I would invite your your readers to kind of flip the script, and this this speaks to the the how Iran might react. Imagine if tomorrow you woke up to a big story in in you know the Wall Street Journal uh, that basically said the supreme leader of Iran says that unless the United States leaves Syria and Iraq within the next six months, they will stop fulfilling their nuclear nuclear obligations under the agreement. Well, that, in, that imposes a new obligation on the United States and then says if we don't follow through with that negotiations, the Iranians will blow up the deal and violate their terms. How would we react to that? I think we would react to that as the Iranians fulfilling their obligations under the deal in bad faith because the deal actually says all parties are obligated to uh, – committed to implementing it in good faith. So I worry very much that this is going to leave us standing alone because of how unreasonable this, this whole posture will seem to the rest of the world. Yeah, the Trump administration's approach really does seem to be that if we kick up enough of a fuss, um, we can force everyone else to go along with us. And I think, you know, Trevor, you, you asked not just about the Iranians, but also about the Europeans. Um, and something that has been very clear over the last couple of months, very strong statements from European ambassadors, very strong statements from leaders of key European states, is that they will not go along with this uh, if Congress decides to snap back sanctions. They will not go along with this if the U.S. decides to add more sanctions on Iran. And so those states will probably make it very difficult for us to apply sanctions, which really raises sort of the question of whether the, what the Trump administration and its supporters are actually proposing here is plausible. Could they get a better deal? Probably not, because they can't do it alone. Yeah, I mean, it's too late to get a better deal in that sense, I think. The time to get the deal was when you were negotiating it. Uh, trying to do that now, it's, it's a little bit it's a little bit hard to imagine how that works. One question that I'm still trying to answer is how much of the opposition to Trump's moves comes from a belief that it, the deal is going to work versus people who sort of think that the fact that Iran was willing to do the deal means they really don't want nuclear weapons anyway. I, it's, hard to, it's hard to say. Look, I think that um – it's fair to assume the worst of the Iranians on this score uh, in the sense that not that they've necessarily irrevocably made the decision to get nuclear weapons, but that 
they've, that they have shown a, a propensity over the last quarter century to at least hedge their bets. That is to at least put themselves in the technological position that if they were to determine that nuclear weapons were important to advance the regime's survival or the regime's objectives, that they could do that. Um, and frankly, some of the shenanigans with North Korea probably reinforces that. So a lot of times, a lot of people have made the argument that us backing away from the Iran deal actually makes it harder for us to negotiate something with, with North Korea. I think that's exactly right because the North Koreans will say, well, why would we believe anything that the administration, uh, any commitments that they might make? But the reverse is also true, which is basically seeing uh, that the North Koreans are so close uh, to having a checkmate uh, nuclear capability that would deter the United States and, and how agitated uh, that has ma made us may reaffirm uh, the, uh, the Iranian belief that their only way actually to deal with the United States is not through some diplomatic arrangement that the United States won't uphold, but to get the ultimate weapon uh, uh, to be able to hold the American homeland at risk. So I worry about that, that reverse uh, causality uh, as well. I think one, one thing, and I, I just want to pick up something that Emma said because it's, it's super important and she's exactly right, which is that if the notion is that you get a quote unquote better deal, that means covering things not covered by the deal and or extending certain terms of the deal. I think what the Europeans have signaled is they're not going to renegotiate the deal. We know the Chinese and the Russians aren't either and the Iranians aren't going to reopen the terms of the deal. The Europeans have said they might be open to discussing supplemental arrangements associated uh, with it. That's good. But that requires a degree of international consensus, not a strategy that isolates us uh, uh, and, uh, and not Iran. And here's the problem. You'll hear critics of the deal say, no, we can basically get anything we want. Look, if we do secondary sanctions uh, on Iran's economy, every bank and firm and business around the world will have to make the decision. You either trade with the United States or you trade with Iran. We're a much bigger economy uh, than the Iranians, so they'll choose not to trade with Iran. That is true of many firms and banks, but not all of them. And in the absence of political consensus, this, any sanctions regime like that will be extraordinarily leaky. And I would just uh, – you know. If, if, ask your listeners to, to think about what, what things were like in the 1990s when the United States had secondary sanctions on Iran on energy and on investments in Iran's energy sector, and the Europeans didn't agree with our policy and therefore ignored us. And the European Union, in fact, had blocking legislation preventing their companies from complying with it. They threatened retaliation if we sanctioned their businesses and banks. They threatened to take us to the WTO uh, uh, and. In this case, you'd have us being at odds with the largest economies in the world. I mean, Iran's major oil purchasers are China, Japan, South Korea, and the Europeans. Are we willing to risk a trade war with the most important economies on the world with significant collateral effects on our own economy? So I think we, even if they go down this road, you're not going to get anywhere near the pressure we had in 2015. I think we got the best possible deal, my, my view, the best possible deal available given the pressure we had. But even if you don't agree with that, we're not going to get 150 percent of the current deal with less than 100 percent of the leverage uh, that we had in, in 2015. It's just the laws of diplomatic physics don't allow uh, that equation uh, to hold. So I guess the big question then is, uh, does Congress understand that? Um, what, I mean, what is Congress going to do? Because it, it very much seems like a lot of different options are still on the table here. You know, we've got the, the Inara legislation, which is basically a simple up or down 50-50 vote on uh, whether they're going to reimpose the sanctions. We've got the possibility that they could basically reopen this legislation and add something else. They could remove the requirement that Trump decertify it every 90 days. They could add these uh, sunset provisions, um, and that would require, I believe, 60 votes rather than the 50 that it calls for right now. But there are several options, and I guess ultimately Congress could also just decide not to do anything. So where do you think they're going to jump? I mean, if, if, if past is prologue, they won't do anything because they can't agree on anything, uh, let alone at the 60, at the 60 vote uh, threshold, which would be required to do anything more than just snapping back uh, the sanctions. Look, I think that um, Senator Cardin on the Democratic side has been pretty clear, uh, as have another a number of other uh, senior Democrats, that um, they're not going to sign on to any legislation that violates the JCPOA. And I think that the way in which the Corker Cotton uh, legislation, at least the drafts that I've been uh, uh, that I've been uh, told about, um, I think would be widely viewed as as a violation of of the deal. And so I just don't think. They're going to get nearly enough uh, Democrats on a piece of legislation like that. I also think that the uh, the Democrats are very attuned to the point that Trevor made about 
America first being America alone. And in particular, there's zero chance that we put more pressure on Iran in the absence of the Europeans being on our side. And so I think Dems are also likely to try to hold any piece of legislation to a European test. So it has to be 100 percent JCPOA compliant and the Europeans, at, le- at the very least, can't be aggravated to the point of, of kind of going their own way as a consequence of that legislation. And I'm not sure that leaves a heck of a lot left. If Congress wants to take actions outside of the deal against their ballistic missiles, against the IRGC, against Hezbollah, they've already passed legislation in that domain. And frankly, the president has all the authorities that he needs to do that. Uh, So I I feel like it's legitimate to have a bipartisan agreement about pushing back against Iran's non-nuclear actions. But Congress has already been very active in that space, including passing legislation uh, tied to Russia sanctions uh, just a couple months ago. Um, And so I think it's just time for the president to get on with it. I mean, if if the weird thing about this is that what everybody agrees on is that the deal didn't solve every problem because it wasn't meant to and that Iran continues to be a troublesome actor in the region because they are. So that would argue that we shouldn't be focusing on the nuclear issue, which is actually contained and capped uh, uh, in the worst case for the next you know, eight to 10 years, probably longer than that, and that we should be focusing on other things. And yet this whole decertification weirdness has ironically made us focus on the one part of the problem that's actually not a pressing problem. <laughs> and in addition to that, wh- why Trump chose to do this during what is already an incredibly busy legislative agenda where he is pressed to make any achievement happen and, and the Republicans in Congress are desperate to get anything major done, dropping this in their lap at the same time is a recipe for uh, one or all things to fail. Uh, he could have just waited six months even. Yes. Would have that would have been a mature decision. Well, I guess we know <laughs> why he didn't do that then. Um, so, I, you know, n- not to forecast too far into the foolish prediction uh, zone, but does, does this make it more likely that Iran does eventually have to decide to get a nuclear weapon? So I, a lot of it depends on, on whether you believe that the deal survives completely, whether the deal collapses, or whether it suffers a slow death. I, I think it's unlikely to completely collapse in the near term because I think for a while there's a consensus inside Iran that they're happy to see uh, the Americans shoot themselves in the foot and alienate themselves from the rest of the international community. So I actually don't think the Iranians are just going to walk out unless uh, Congress – reimposes the nuclear-related sanctions, in which case it becomes politically untenable for the Iranians to stand in, or if we reimpose sectoral secondary sanctions uh, for other reasons um, that uh, – but that are seen as effectively reimposing uh, the nuclear sanctions. But before then, I think you're more likely to see uh, the Iranians stick in. But I do think if if the Trump administration continues not to be seen as as, um, advancing the deal in good faith, you will see an erosion of domestic political support among uh, uh, powerful factions in t- inside Iran over time, which could lead the the agreement to uh, suffer a slow death. The other thing is, if you see the United States and Iran coming to military blows inside Syria or Iraq or in the Strait of Hormuz or elsewhere, you could see a security spiral um, that leaves the the, the uh, Iran deal in tatters as kind of collateral damage to that, and may increase the incentive for the Iranians to move towards their own deterrent. Yeah, and and you know, I think this question about conflict is is kind of an interesting one because we 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 have seen Trump, you know, make these statements where he's sort of seems to be tie, trying to tie Al Qaeda to Iran. I mean, there have been some ties there, but they're fairly slim. He seems to be trying to make this into more of a big thing. And as I think you noted earlier, Colin, there's there really are some overtones of 2002, 2003 here. And so the question is, if Congress doesn't do anything. What will Trump do? Will he follow through on these threats that he has made to uh, nix the deal if Congress doesn't do anything? Will he consider military action against Iranian nuclear facilities, against Iranian military facilities? Or is that just outside the realm of of possibility here? It's a great question. Um, I I think that there is a general consensus uh, within the administration that we need to have sharper elbows with the Iranians. But I don't think there's a desire to have an overt war. I think that uh, you know a lot of the adults in the room. Uh, I think, in particular, uh, Jim Mattis, Joe Dunford over at the uh, over at the Pentagon, understand that 
Uh, there are things that we could do inside of the Middle East that would put our forces in Iraq and Syria at, at grave risk. Um, and so I think they're trying to manage it. So the question is, how do you hit the sweet spot of pushing back against uh, the Iranians without uh, uh, you know, moving to the point of escalation? I will say, though, that, that your listeners have to be uh, you know, aware that you know, things could spiral out of control in ways that, that aren't, aren't – well understood, and I'll just give I'll give one example. In the summer of twenty of two thousand eleven, as we were uh, withdrawing our forces from Iraq, uh, we got a lot of folks killed uh, as they were leaving their bases from Iranian-made rockets launched by Shia militia. At the time, two options were brought to President Obama about how to deal with this. One was to authorize our special operations forces to do unilateral raids against uh, uh, these rocket teams, uh, and the other was to launch Tomahawk cruise missiles into uh, munitions factories and training camps inside of Iran. Uh, the president ultimately decided on the letting the special operations forces do their work inside Iraq. Uh, but it's worth noting that that uh, Jim Mattis, who at the time was uh, the commander of CENTCOM, uh, advocated option two, that is uh, missile strikes into Iran. And the reason I say that is we don't really have the option of having our special operations forces go full unilateral inside Iraq or uh, because they just there aren't as many of them uh, and there are a lot more Shia militia. Uh, so that's not really an option. So I do worry things could go that way. And the other example I would use just briefly and sorry to go on for so long, but in January of 2016, you'll, re you'll remember we got almost a dozen sailors swept up uh, near an Iranian island uh, in the Persian Gulf and uh, by the IRGC Navy. Those sailors were returned within 24 hours without a shot fired because we had multiple channels of communication. I think Kerry called Zarif, uh, you know, half a dozen times. Uh, we were able to basically use the channels that we had under the nuclear deal to make sure that this didn't spiral into a hostage crisis. I don't know anybody who believes that if a similar situation were to happen again tomorrow, if we get some guys killed or get some guys captured, that this is going to end well. I think it could – because we don't have those channels of communication. We don't have those trusts. There's a lot of animosity, a lot of uh, uh, conflicting interests. So I worry very much about the inadvertent side of this. So the good news is the adults in uh, in Trump's uh, uh, you know cabinet are hawkish on Iran but probably don't want an overt war. The bad news is – there's, they're hawkish on Iran, and you could see all sorts of situations in which a, a war happens by accident or inadvertently. That's a chilling anecdote and probably a good thing to leave our listeners with to contemplate um, between now and our next episode. Um, thanks for joining us on this episode of uh, Power Problems, and thanks to Colin for joining us. I appreciate it. Um, before we sign off, just a quick event note. Uh, you can join us here at Cato on November 6th for How Do You Solve a Problem Like North Korea? a conference featuring uh, former New Mexico governor and ambassador Bill Richardson, uh, Plowshares Fund President Joe Cerencioni, and many other experts. A big thanks to our producer, Jeff Geld. And if you liked the episode, uh, please consider writing us a positive review on iTunes. You can connect with us on social media using the hashtag FPPowerProblems. <laughs>